All right, and thank you for my whatever. It's my little card here. I thank you so much for that. That's so sweet. Um, and I would like some pictures of everyone gathered with Lois and flowers and cake and all before we disperse. Can every will everyone help me remember to do that? Okay, and I'll post it on Facebook, and I'll be in trouble with nobody because you guys all think that it's awesome that I do that, right? <laughs> okay. All righty. Now let's get started on spiritual gifts. Okay, we want to start with a good review. Um, of all the things that we've learned. Now, I, I know that at this point, you probably have this all really well down, but the the subject of spiritual gifts is such a, a I think, a little known subject in the, in the church itself. For some reason, we don't discuss it very much. It is not something that is really addressed very often from the pulpit, right? Um, and even though I think that intuitively we know the truths concerning spiritual gifts i think intuitively we know that when a person becomes a believer there is a transformation that takes place in their life right their focus their energies their their appetites everything about a person just changes that that you know you have become a new creation you know old things are passed away behold all things are become new Th that is something that if if in fact there's been a true salvation that is the marker the identifying marker um last week we covered uh although very superficially, but we covered the gift of tongues. As you know, one of the things about the gift of tongues, the issue that comes up in the uh, through the charismatic movement, for many of the charismatic movements anyway, those churches, is that they show that the sign of speaking in tongues is the sign of your actual salvation. And, you know, I just want to say this morning, this is your morning to actually come to an understanding of what your markers are of a true sal salvation moment. If you truly know the Lord, there are going to be indicators that have nothing to do with a spiritual gift, which, by the way, if, if tongues were the sign of salvation, what would that mean then for every believer? That every believer would what? speak in tongues because if you're if you receive the holy spirit at salvation do we what do we know about covenant do you, is the holy spirit re a requirement for you to have actually come into salvation if you don't have the spirit what you don't have the son you don't have life right first john teaches he who has the son has life he who does not have the son does not have life so if you don't have the son of god abiding in you dwelling within you by the holy spirit which he promised which the father promised to send then you do not have salvation therefore every believer if you are a christian you have the abiding holy spirit dwelling within you um ezekiel 36 right I will take your heart of stone. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my precepts and statutes. That verse alone, I, I kind of got tickled with K. Arthur's homework for us because we spent, what, three days looking at 1 John? Uh, was it 2, 3, and no, 3, 4, and 5, right? And we, what, how many lists did you make? Pages and pages. I don't know about you guys, but I have like on my computer two columns on a one sheet and two columns on another sheet of notes just on the subject of of the indication of the holy spirit's presence through the subject of love in first john and i'm thinking no all you really need to do k was go to that one verse in ezekiel 36 because it says that i will place my spirit within you that's the new covenant the whole subject matter in those three verses i think it's 27 to 29 maybe something like that in Ezekiel 36 it talks about the old covenant that you broke the one that you did not keep Israel I am going to make a new covenant with Israel in that day and I will remove their heart of stone I will give them the heart of flesh and I will place my spirit within you so if you look at that the whole context of that is we know that in salvation 
with Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. That is the new covenant. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you're not in covenant, right? And therefore, this whole um, concept, if you blend it then with what we've looked at with spiritual gifts, does every believer get the same gifts? Does any believe, do, is there any one gift that all believers have? Is there any one spiritual gift? Teaching. Does anyone in here, would anyone ever say, every believer, if they're a believer, they're a teacher. They have the spiritual gift of teaching. Now, obviously, we all teach on some level, but I'm talking about the spiritual gift. The answer is no. Why? What does 1 Corinthians 12 teach us about the gifts? Yeah, and that not, ev is everyone an apostle, are they? Are, do all have the gift of, you know, I can't remember, how does it say it here? Um, all are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, I wish. Boy, if I could have one gift, that would probably be the one that would be really cool. I want to do gifts of miracles, and I'll start with, actually, or the, or the gifts of healings. Let's do that one. Verse 30. All do not have gifts of healings, do they? Boy, I wish. I w and I wish the gifts of healing were according to my agenda, not God's, because, and I don't really mean that, as you know, but God's agenda for healings is that it's a tool. What kind of a tool is it for? for evangelism, right? It's not the gift of being able to just walk around, put your hands on someone, pray for them, and they get well. That is not the gift of, the spiritual gift of healings. Now, does God heal? Can people lay hands on you, pray for you, that God would intervene and heal you? Of course. Of course. And is that spiritual? Yes. But is that the spiritual gift of healing? The answer is, no. So isn't it an amazing thing when you think about the, the work of God and, and the, the mixed up confusion that you get out of some of these, I hate to pick on them, but the charismatic movement where they have hijacked one spiritual gift, made it so big and, and so overwhelmingly um, important. And they have subdued. And this is exactly what 1 Corinthians did. The, the church in Corinthians had done this. This is why Paul was correcting it, right? He was making. But in the end, what did he say, however, about the gifts? Don't forbid the speaking in tongues, right? So he balanced it. First, he says, look, you guys have got to get it right. But on the other hand, I do not want any one of you to say, I forbid anyone to speak in tongues. Because why? There is a spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. But, but the gift of tongues is not a sign of your salvation. It is not the indication that you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is recognized in you by the things that come from your life once you have been sealed by the Spirit. I am going to take us this morning through 1 John, the subject of love, but I want to walk us through 1 John on the whole. Because do you know what the purpose of the writing of 1 John is? Does anybody know what the purpose statement is in that letter? They, they, so that you may know that you have eternal life. These things are written so that you may know that you have eternal life. And then he lists all through five chapters a variety of things that you are to look for, indicators, what Jesus refers to in Matthew as the fruit on the tree. Look at the fruit of the tree. That's the indicator as to whether or not a person is saved or not. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at First John together, and then we're going to pull out of it those things which you all looked at concerning love. But what we are, I hope, have done between last week and this week, and I don't know if you've thought about all that I just kind of opened with um, on your own, but it is very important that you have an answer to those who have the, the concept of spiritual gifts, speaking in tongue, gifts of healings and miracles and all these things, that you have an answer that balances it, but it has to be through, through the Word of God. 
You have to be able to say, no, that I know that's what you think, but that's not true, and this is why. This is what God says. And you can literally take them to 1 John, at, in, I think it's in chapter 5, right to the verse that says, and these things have been written that you may know that you have eternal life. How do I know that someone is saved? It does not say they speak in tongues. And that is the message that's out there. And, and in a lot of ways, the reason I'm kind of, pulling this out today is because it is controversial. We don't like to say some of these things out loud because we don't want to hurt our brothers or sisters in Christ who do have that gift. So we're not trying to to bash their 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 the gifting that God has given to them if they have the gift of tongues. But on the other hand, we don't want error of of doctrine to be out there either. We need to get the truth correct to the best of our ability. Um, you know all I can say is the gifts are given to the body on the whole. And what we need to fully understand is how they were given, why they were given, when they were given, what their design purpose is, right, for each of them, at least somewhat. If I throw these things out to you, you should be able to come back to me and say, oh, that gift is for this, that gift is for this. And now you've got them properly identified. You can place your members into the body in the right place of works, right? And you're giving God glory when the when the fruit begins to bear itself. But you as an individual need to have confidence that you are you have the Holy Spirit based on truth, not on some crazy statement of, you know, the sign is the, the gift of tongues. I don't even know how they got that out of the scripture. I don't see it written anywhere. I think what they did is they saw Acts and they saw the three references in Acts, which were markers for the for the statement of you will when Jesus says you will be my witnesses in these three areas, which all it did was exponentially grow. It grew from the Jerusalem, Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. That's what Jesus said. You will be my witnesses in these in these ways. And then the book of Acts at each of those marker points, the Holy Spirit was shown in a profound way through gift, the gift of tongues. It was the sign. So then they took that, I think, and then made that to be the sign for salvation. And it was it's a misappropriation of Scripture. And it's a throwing away of everything that's said in 1 Corinthians 12. Right? So let's go back and look at 12 real quickly and see what we see here. Uh, first of all, I want to define the, the word. Okay, the word is gifts. So what are gifts? And we know it's the number 5486. I'm just giving you this much because it wasn't in your homework this was week and you might not remember. Do you remember what the word is in Greek? Charisma, right? Charisma. And so how is it defined specifically? And by the way, if you all want cake, or anything in the back there, please help yourself. I, you, do, you won't bother me at all to get up and move because I'm oblivious. But, you know, <laughs> but the cake looks really good back there. So thank you so much, by the way, Carol, for picking up cake and flowers for us. That was really sweet. Thank you. All right. Now, all right, back to charisma. <laughs> See how easily I'm diverted, <laughs> my little brain. Okay. Def, define uh, the the word gift for me. If God has given you a spiritual gift, what is what is this gift? How is it defined? Grace, grace exactly. It is a gift of grace. G R A C E. Grace. What does it mean? Grace. What is grace, by the way? Can you define grace? There you go. Undeserved or unmerited favor, right? Grace, undeserved, uh, unmerited or unearned, right? Favor. So what does that tell you right there? Just by its definition, what does that tell you about a spiritual gift? It is from God himself and... How much about you comes into this? Zero. <laughs> this is all God's doing, all God's choosing, all God's planning, all God's foreknowledge. Obviously, I mean, I know we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but 
do you think that God um, uses the personality that you have in your gifting? Do you think that he also uses any kind of skills that you've developed through your lifetime? Absolutely. But are those the reason he has chose you for the gifting that he gave you? There's a verse in 1 Corinthians that talks about, I've chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. I am an example of that because I've got no of official training. I have not been to college. I do not have a doctorate in it. I've never been to seminary. I hated school as a kid. I was a horrible student. I barely got out of high school. Not kidding. I mean, and I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to demean myself. I'm just showing you the grace of God. It's an amazing thing what he can do when he takes a person that, why he chose to to gift me with spirit, the spiritual gift of teaching. And not just gifting, but to bring me into something like a precept course, which is high, is a higher um, challenge, really, in the, in the teaching field. Because I've got all of you, and you guys have got an amazing amount of knowledge that you're bringing to the plate. And many of you are so mature already in your faith, you could be teaching this, right? But God chose me. He placed me in the body as he determined. And he did so, although he's used my personality, sorry, but he used my, he uses my personality. However, he also did not choose me, though, because I was, quote, qualified. It is a gift of grace. It's undeserved. It's, it's unearned favor, right? And once he placed me in there, then, then he wants us to do what? Put yourself, whatever your gifting is, in that mindset. You may have brought more to the plate for God's benefit than I did, but it's still unearned, right? And we are still a flawed vessel through which God works, correct? I think about, um, I think it's in Thessalonians, it says some, some are vessels for noble and some for ignoble, and it's talking about, obviously, believers and unbelievers, but I often consider myself an ignoble vessel <laughs> because I have, I'm a cracked pot, for sure. So what does that tell you then about the subject of spiritual gifting and your relationship to the working out of it? it yeah. Okay, yes. It is the power of God at work in you. And I think sometimes when the more cracked the vessel is, the more more glowing out of that cracked pot that God gets. I mean, he gets a way more credit, I think, through some than through others, because sometimes it is easy to fall back on, well, they've been to DTS and they've, they've, you know, they're, they're a pastor and they've got, you know, I think sometimes those who, I think sometimes they probably wish they had more of a pedigree that I have, because then God gets all the glory, right? If a person is not uh, technically trained um, in administration, right? We got an, we have an extraordinaire administrator in Miss Lois, um, but the the more that person is able to glorify God, the more that they allow get out of the way basically through the things that they they think they might bring to the plate the more God gets the glory in that. And that's where, that is the goal, right? Knowing it's God's favor then, okay, un, un, it's charisma, it's grace, it's undeserved, it's unearned. Let's go into, it is a, basically, it's also a free gift, by the way. I'm just going to add that to the plate. But there is in 1 Corinthians um, 12, 7, Tell me what that says in there about the point of it. And you tell me, what it, what is the purpose of the gift? I bet you can tell me without even looking. There you go. It's given for the common good. So I like this. The way that it states it, though, is this. It's a manifestation. Of the spirit. So there's our Holy Spirit at work, right, for the common good. Um, 
And how are these, well, tell me this, who gets, who gets a gift? What, now, and just the logic of it, why do we know everyone gets a spiritual gift? If, it, if it's the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, right, why is it that every believer gets a gift? Because every believer gets the Spirit of God. Isn't that, it's not a trick question. <laughs> it, to me, it was like a duh, right? It would almost be illogical to think that you don't have a spiritual gift. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Well, of course I have the Holy Spirit. I'm saved. Well, if the Holy Spirit's dwelling in you, guess what? Then you have a spiritual gift of some kind. God's, because his, the manifestation of that spirit will be displayed through you when you begin to operate and walk in the, in the spirit himself, right? As you submit to the spirit and walk in the spirit. But the, the very fact that he's present already, it assures you that you have the gifting. As a matter of fact, in many ways, what you can say is because we have the spirit, we technically we have all the giftings. However, there is a motivational gift and there is a placement in the body that God has assigned, correct? What does he say about that? Okay. So we're going to put on here, who gets all? Yeah, who gives it? God, as he wills, right? Uh and it, it, and how do we get it then? Uh, we've spoke about this. How? By the Spirit at salvation. Can you tell me a verse on that in chapter 12? I think it's 13, correct? Somebody read 13. Okay, so if we're all made to drink of the one spirit, and it's by the spirit that we receive the gifts, therefore when the spirit comes into us, we receive our gifting specifically. But it is God, it says he places us, he places us as he will. So the placement, the assignment of where you're going to be operating in the body of Christ is predetermined by God himself right? His design purpose. Now, would you say though that on occasion, probably most of us, it might take us a while to figure out where we fit, especially if you're unaware of the concept of spiritual gifts to begin with, right? Um, how, how do you think is the best way for a person to discover where it is that God has placed them in the body? What would be good a good way of helping a young believer or a, or a person who's just coming to understand this? There you go. The be one of the best ways is to just get busy, to start doing stuff, right? How many of you have stepped into jobs in the church, working ministry work at various kinds, and found out no more than five seconds in that it was not a good choice. <laughs> oh, Kristen, she's waving big time. So would you like to share that with us? <laughs> when Michael and I were newly married, we were at United Methodist Church, and they needed new leaders. Mm. It was so bad. I told him, he liked it. He's all about kids. So for him, it was an easy like fit. I was just like, I have no children of my own. Why should I deal with other people's disrespectful children? <laughs> there you go. Exactly. And now, what kind of work was it that you were doing? Were you doing teaching? Were you doing mentoring? Were you doing Bible study teaching? Were you, what was the role that you were doing? Okay. Not your thing. Okay. So she found out very quickly, teaching is not her gift, right? And her interest, her area of interest also was not having a heart either for it. So it seems like there seems to be a double, a double quality thing that goes on. Not only do you need to get to work doing it, but you also have to kind of feel your way to see what, what stimulates you, what, what motivates you, what, what interests you, right? So, um, any other stories like that you got put in the wrong place and you knew it immediately or soon? <laughs> I did the same thing. I volunteered for 
with three year olds and realized that they still need diapers. Diapers. <laughs> oh gosh. At least. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. Yeah. Well and well, and with little ones, that what do you think the gifting is for administering in a, like that with little children of that age? What is it pretty much all about? Patience. Well, that's the virtue, but what is the spiritual gift? Mercy, maybe? Yeah. Just the, the, the compassion, the mercy, um, or it could be helps, could be. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> you know, Kristen, I think you got something there. It could be speaking in tongues is right. I hadn't thought of that one. That's funny. <laughs> okay, so so gifting is about finding the right fit. It's about experimenting a little bit in the beginning. It's about finding what really does kind of um, emotionally connect for you in a positive way. That because I do believe that God, when he when you get in the right place that God has placed you, don't you think God will give you that little bell that goes ding ding ding? Yeah. Okay. So. It's he since he has placed us as he wills, he's already figured it out. He knows where he's heading you. So now your job is to find your way to to where God has you. Um, there's another issue that can also happen for some of the giftings, and that is for some of the giftings like mine, teaching, it requires a measure of knowledge, right? So you don't just step into it on day one of your salvation. On day one of your salvation, you're going Yes, I love Jesus. I understand the concept of having put my faith and trust in him, believing God for, for all things, right? But uh, where is Deuteronomy, <laughs> right? What, it, you know, other than for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that might have been the only verse I came to the plate with because I think I did know that one from childhood. But I don't think I came in knowing a whole lot. So for some of you, just so you know this and so that you can encourage people you know, in a positive way, you know, don't forget that, that once you come into the body and you start experimenting around, you find a place that you're really loving, it doesn't mean that you will necessarily do it perfectly the first time. Um, I know that I experimented with several places in the body of Christ when I first came in. Administration was not my very best one. I can do it, um, but it's more about a discipline than it is a joy, <laughs> right? So I can do it if I have to. I have done it in many cases over, over the years, but as soon as somebody else says, let me handle that, I will very happily step out of the way. Um, leadership, not my thing. Will I take charge? I certainly take charge in my class, you know, but, but it's about teaching and about leading. Um, leadership is so far outside of my idea of fun <laughs> and of comfort. It is not a comfort zone. But have you ever been around a natural leader? W what's your response as they kind of get crazy ideas and start saying, hey, let's. You do. I've had, I remember I had this one girlfriend, her, her name was Anne. I really think it was one of her gifts. Her teaching was definitely her primary, but leadership was definitely another one. She would come up the craziest things and all 10 or 15 of us other girls in the room would go, okay, <laughs> we were on board. We would do whatever she suggested. It was a go, but I could say, hey, we should, and yak, 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 yak. They didn't even hear me say we should, right? Nobody followed me. I do think the indicators are watch to see how people are responding to you. Another good thing to tell people as they're trying to discover what their spiritual gift is, is be sensitive to see whether or not that there's a positive response to what you're offering. Um, it's horrible to sit in a classroom with a teacher that's not a gifted teacher because they're, it's generally it's boring for one thing, but you also get frustrated because you don't feel like you really know more when you left than when you came, you know, um, or it's not fun to be under um, a, a person who is trying to be merciful, but they're not, you know, if, if you want mercy, you go to the mercy girl. Because you know that you're going to get comfort in that moment in almost immediate, right? Uh, um, there was one gal I remember from years back. Her name was 
Connie Cummings, and I I still am very good friends with her. I, I see her from time to time, and we chat on Facebook and things. But she literally could walk in a room, and just this calm would come behind her. She just exhumed this state of calm and peace and love and acceptance and forgiveness and mercy and it was just all over her right but she wasn't the girl the go-to girl if you wanted to have a party because she was the calm girl you know if you want to go to the fun girl you find the girl who's outgoing who's the exhorter who's the the um maybe a leader like my friend ann and she was she was party girl extraordinaire and everybody went and we all had fun so you your gifting is about figuring out your own personality being genuine and true to yourself and evaluating it right examining yourself it's also being perceptive to people around you and listening to what they're saying in response thank you for doing that oh we couldn't live without you or we couldn't have done that without you that's when you know you're you've stepped into the right place right okay so yes absolutely gross it gets it bigger grows. better yeah Well, and you know, you kind of triggered another thought in there too for me, and that is also opportunities. If it's God's design for you to be in a certain area in the body of Christ, he is going to keep opening the door for you in that area. People are going to come to you and say, will you do this? Now, I, I know that at some point you have to learn the discipline of saying no to some things, right? And being discerning. But in the beginning, you might have to say yes to a lot of things, but eventually you can start backing off on the ones you figured out aren't for you, right? But one thing I do know, and this is where for my, my journey personally was, it did not matter where I went, and we were military, so we moved and moved and moved. I went to all kinds of different churches, right? And people who, you start out, they don't even know who you are, but almost immediately... God opened a door for me everywhere I went to do some form of teaching. I was teaching ch children in, you know, uh, Sunday school. I was teaching vacation Bible school. I was teaching women in Bible study in my homes. I was, you know, it was always about me teaching something. Even if I wasn't teaching Bible study, I was teaching quilting and crafting and, you know, something in a ministry that where I was the one explaining what you're supposed to be doing, which is a hoot. But in any event, I, that was the way God did it for me. And so what I can tell you is if you're open, your antennas up, and as you're talking with people who are still confused on this subject, I, I think most of you in here have probably got it figured out. But but for those that you're trying to help, tell them, listen, be sensitive to God's opening of doors because he opens doors and he closes them, right? Sometimes there will be a door that will be open and you'll step into it and very quickly you'll figure out, I shouldn't have. That was not the right fit for me. But you gracefully either finish your tenure to the best of your ability and then you step out of it. Uh, or if you can leave immediately, you can do so. But I mean, sometimes we have to finish our yes, let your yes be yes, right? Um, so if you've stepped in, finish out what you have to finish out, but then step away and say, I won't be doing that again, right? Learn as you go along. But know this, if it's your gifting, it's your calling, and if God has placed you, I mean, he does place you. So he will open those doors for you to do that. But that does not let you off the hook for not also investigating and going to look for, right? I, th I think about Paul's messages in scriptures where he talks about Onesiphorus and um, some of these other names I can't pronounce that are big. But they would literally go looking for Paul in these places to minister to him, to help, help him. So sometimes it does take on our part some effort to step into to things and, and give them a try, right? Okay, so who gets them? All, everyone, right? Who gives them? God does. He places us in the body as he determines or as he wills. Um, why do we have them? It, why? For, yeah, to edify 
the body. If we didn't get anything out of all the stuff we've looked at, that is probably the most important quality about your gift. Your gift, by the way, is not to edify yourself. It's not for you to feel good about it, even though we hope you do. You know, I mean, I love my teaching. I, I'm very happy in my teaching. But God didn't give me my gift for me to be edified. He gave it to me so that I would minister to the body. It's for the common good, right? To edify the body for the common good. And then what's the result? If I'm edifying the body and I'm working for the common good, what's going to happen to the body of Christ as I, as I exercise my gifting? Yeah, it's going to build it up. It's going to, it's going to build the body. To build up the body, the body of Christ, the kingdom of God itself. So if you're an evangelist, how are you building up the body? You're bringing in more people, right? Um, if, you're, if your gift is mercy, how are you building up the body? Yeah, you're caring for the downtrodden, the people who are crushed and perplexed and dismayed over whatever is going on in their life. So... Your gift is to build up the body. So if you are, are, if you have a gift and you think this is my gift and all it does is make you feel good, what? Yes, it's all about self. And, that, and therefore, as we've looked at this week in our homework, is that what we're supposed to be about? No, the whole, the whole concept doesn't even fit together if you think about it, because Jesus himself, he was the, the greatest demonstration of loving the body and building it up, right? He established the church and he did so sacrificially by giving himself for the church. So we need to know that we are to edify the body. It's for the common good. It's to build the body up. Okay. Um, now let's go back. Let's look at the occasion, the context for what we're going to be looking at this morning. Um, I want to go back to what the book of first Corinthians is all about on the whole. What was the context there? Do you remember when we did, uh, first Corinthians as a study as a group together and that's not been that long ago what was the problems what was going on in this church yeah there was all kinds of, okay so the problem the problems were what list them tell me what you remember divisions In other words, quarrels, right? What else? Immorality. Immorality. Idolatry. Idolatry. What about their relationships with one another? What was going on there? Do you remember when they says, well, some say I'm of Paul and some say I'm of Apollos and some say I'm of, right? What was going on there? Who were they following and who should they have been following? Yeah, they were following men. Now, when you follow men instead of God, right? Instead of Christ being the center of their focus, they were following men. Now, when you follow men, what does that mean? Explain that to me. Why would you follow men and what's your motivation? What's your thinking? Okay, so identifying yourself with a certain man rather than Christ himself, you think that that somehow benefits you. It makes you look good and it puts you in right standing maybe with certain group, right? So you end up might end up with even power, right? Okay, any other thoughts? All right, so following men instead of Christ, immoralities, idolatries, divisions, quarrels, strife, jealousy, 
that was the that's the opposite of that instead instead of following men you're so jealous of them that you basically re repel them right your your jealousy leads leads you or takes you to the opposite response instead of being enamored with them and panting after them like a puppy dog, right? Following them from room to room. Do you ever have grandkids that used to do that when they were little? They follow you all over the house. As soon as you got in the bathroom, they're on the door like this, you know, pounding. Okay, so if you are enamored with a person, you're following after men, basically, instead of God. You're enamored with them, so your affections are towards the person, right? And you're, you're hoping to be in good standing with them. Maybe it'll bring you some kind of power or, or good favor. Um, but instead, the other thing can happen also. You can, you can see a person who seems to be exalted and enamored by others, and you become jealous of them, wanting those affections for yourself. And so the jealousy then is the one that you deal with. So in this church, we were seeing all these kinds of things. They were, they were following men, not Christ. They had gone also down into immoralities and things like idolatry. They were suing one another. I mean, they were, there was, they were such a, if this letter were not written to us, we would not have the treasure of being able to see ourselves in the mirror <laughs> in this book. This book is just loaded with all kinds of problems. You name it, that church had it. Okay, so there, and by the way, it was so bad that Chloe's people had gone to Paul. Remember at the end of the letter in chapter, or maybe it was at the beginning in chapter one. I can't remember now if it was one or at the very end, but either way, but th that Chloe had gone to them and presented to them these problems that were going on in the church. That's how bad it had gotten. All right, so context for 13 now. We, that's 1 Corinthians. Now for... Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians, the segment division, right? 11 to 14. What is the context for 11 through 14? Let's get the bigger context first. What is your major subject for a chat, starting in chapter 11? Do you remember what the subject matters were? Okay, there you go. Good girl. You went right to the end of it. Okay. The assembly of the church meaning the church itself, the gathering, right? It's, it was instruction. On, uh, I'm going to put on here instruction and correction for worship, right? For corporate worship. And we had a problem with women that was addressed, right? We had the Lord's Supper. Those were in chapter 11. Now, what happens in 12, 12 to 14? Now it's spiritual gifts. This is the subject of spiritual gifts. Now, if our pro, if our if our subject matter in the flow of thought is problems, right? We haven't changed our subject matter, have we? Okay, so now you know that it's all about problems, and it's problems concerning spiritual gifts. The very first thing that he mentions in chapter 1 about spiritual gifts is what does he say in 12.1? Yeah, so he says, now concerning... Spiritual gifts. I do not want you to be un unaware. Okay, so that is very, very helpful to as far as just seeing con the context of 1 Corinthians itself. If every time you go in there and look at those spiritual gifts, in particular chapter 14, where all these issues come up and they're discussing the subject where they're they're contrasting two major spiritual gifts, prophecy and, and tongues, right? And so if you understand that they're doing it in the context of the fact that this is a church that was full of divisions and quarrels, they weren't follow they were following men not 
Christ so much, there was all kinds of basically um, disorder in that church, correct? It was all about disorder, various kinds of disorder or bad behavior. They were suing one another, right? That was one. There was a man having his own mother. I think it was probably the stepmother is, my, is the guess is what I've been heard or been told through through other sermons. But these immoralities were so bad that even the world wasn't in approval of a lot of it. And yet it was going on in the church. And so this church had so many issues. So when you get into spiritual gifts, don't lose the context of the fact that whatever they were doing, it was wrong. And so when you're looking at what you're looking at, you're looking at correction. And when he says, I don't want you to be unaware, what he's saying is, you guys are unaware. You guys obviously do not understand the subject of spiritual gifts, and you do not understand what your spiritual gifts are for. There's a designed purpose for them. And there's been misunderstanding about how you get them and, and uh, who gives them, how you're placed in the body. And the fact that this church in 1 Corinthians 14 was, he says, you're zealous for spiritual gifts, right? But I wish that you would be zealous for prophecy rather than for the gift of tongues. So what does that tell you about the gift of tongues in this church? They were all doing it. They were all seeking it. They were all clamoring for it. And he's saying about that, have you ever had, had your mama do this? No, no. <laughs> this is a, this is so pretty much everything you look at when you read through 1 Corinthians 14, what you can say is whatever he says, and then you can say, and that's wrong. <laughs> and don't do that, right? And stop it. So this is what you need to consider when you when you look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 in, in there. Even in 13, our famous passage, which is what? Love. Even in that one, he's saying, don't do it the wrong way. Don't do it unless you have love. If you're doing your gift without love, you're missing the whole point. The motivation behind the point to the gift is that it's to be an expression of the love of God. If it's the manifestation of the Spirit in you, what is one of the number one things about the Holy Spirit? Who is he? He's love. Okay, so that lays down that. Now I am very quickly want to go back and, and scratch your brains a little bit about the historical background on um what was going on in Corinth at the time? Remember, we talked last week a little bit about the about the worship systems that they came out of, right? And what were they? Do you remember what was going on in Corinth and what's, what Corinth is known for? Mm -hmm. Lots of pagan temples. And with pagan temples, what are some of the behaviors or the um, activities of those churches? Yeah, prostitution was one, yes. Now, regarding the subject of, spirit, of speaking in tongues, what, what else took place with these religions? They spoke in tongues. Guess what? Galatse is not, it is not exclusive to the church, just so you know that. Speaking in tongues was, had been, I, oh, I have a book. Do I, did I, yes, I brought it. This book is so good. If you have never read this book, this is by Richard C. Schwab. He is a pastor. I'm gonna just gonna put. He it's called "Let the Bible Speak About Tongues" by Richard C. Schwab. He's a pastor. He's also a DTS graduate. At the end of it, it says T H period M period. Does anybody know what that stands for? It's like a master's degree in something. Theological masters. Okay, the theological master's degree. Okay, so that must be what his degree is from DTS. Okay, so in here, what I love about this book, because as you guys all know, I do not read. I hate to read books. I'm not a book reader. Unless, I know, isn't that funny? I shocked you. <laughs> Listen, a lot of people think that about me. It's like, she doesn't read? I don't, but I will study. So if you give me a book on the subject we're 
into at the moment, like we're studying, I use it like a reference. I never read front to back. I, I read back to front. I'm, I, I tend to read it, start in the back of a book. Um, and I just pick out excerpts. I just, I don't ever read the whole thing. I'm just, my brain won't let me read like that. I can do that with the word of God though. I can read, I think it's a, that ADD yeah, that's it. It was hard for me. It's why I barely got through school because it was hard for me. Okay, so with all that said, this guy's really good. I, I want you to see this. I have got so much stuff marked in this book. Can you see all those? I, For one thing, I have to read with a marker because I can't, my brain won't focus. Otherwise, I use the marker to help my eye focus. And when I hit a point that I think is really significant, I mark it. Sometimes I have the whole book yellow, <laughs> but this one is really good. So what he does is in chapter one, he gives a historical record of tongues throughout history, throughout history. So he starts, he talks Old Testament, New Testament, big picture. And then he goes through the ages and brings you forward. And he talks about the subject specifically of tongues. Okay. So he says, a biblical scope, but look at how much reading there is on that. Like three paragraphs. That's my kind of writer. I like him. Tongues in the Old Testament is one paragraph. Tongues in the New Testament is also one small paragraph. Ancient occurrences, and now he goes through it, and here's where he talks about uh, three of Plato's dialogues refer to religious ecstatic speech. He cites the utterances of the prophetess at Delphi, the priestess at Dodona, and the Sibyl as examples of such speech. Apparently, their utterances were only considered significant when they were unintelligible. Now, that's interesting, don't you think? Um, he also describes the incomprehensible speech of certain diviners whose utterances were expounded by an attendant prophet or interpreter. So there you go. There's the gift of tongues. Somebody who speaks in a babble that makes no, not, it's total nonsense. It's not a language. That's what they did in these cult religions. And in this one, they had an interpreter who would then speak to the congregation and tell them what he said. I'm sure it was all pre-planned. Yeah, we're all laughing about it. I know. Uh, in my mind, I'm going, yeah, I've got a bridge to sell you somewhere, right? Okay. So this was really good. Um, he he taught, okay, so that was ancient occurrences. I only read you a little bit of it, but I almost read you the whole thing. See how quick that was? I love this guy. Uh, modern occurrences. He talks about certain people, but he also talked, listen, Voodoo practitioners speak in tongues, as do Buddhists and the, the Shinto priests. Muslims are also included. Their leader, Muhammad, found it difficult to return to logical and intelligible speech after his ecstatic experiences. So my point to bring this out to you is speaking in tongues is is also found in the occult. It's also found in the false religions of the world. Why do you think that is? What do we know about Satan? He is a counterfeit expert. He loves to do anything which will counterfeit the works of God. Um, uh, uh, you all know Lisa, who substituted for me in the beginning of, was it this? It was this study, yeah. Um, she said that in her class, she went all the way back to the Tower of Babel and did a, a whole teaching on how the, the our languages and the world became diverse, right? How God separated or, or, or caused the people to separate and move out by giving us all the languages. And that the gift of tongues is actually a reversal of that for certain people that he assigns. When he gives them that gifting, he's saying, I'm going to give you an ability to communicate with people you otherwise would not be able to communicate with. And what is the point to the tongue speaking? What is its purpose? It's for the gospel. It's an evangelism tool. It's so that you can speak to people you otherwise would not be able to speak and give them the gospel, the, the mighty deeds of God, as it says in Acts 2, right? And so he, he speaks. So modern occurrences, he goes through and he basically lay, gives you all kinds of groups that you will be familiar with today who have this thing called speaking in tongues. So is it no wonder that a false 
picture of it or a false use of it could creep into the church. This is what happened at Corinth. It creeped in. Why? Because they had it all over in their culture. But don't think that they're the only ones. We too have that influence in our culture. And so some of these churches that are out there that are using this gift incorrectly are doing so because they have fallen victim to the the wiles of Satan, basically. I'm not saying that they are not believers who are doing this. I'm not saying that because I don't know their heart. I don't know their relationship. But what I am saying is it's a misuse. Paul did not condemn every person at Corinth and say, none of you are Christians because you're doing this. Okay. What he is saying is stop it. You're using it incorrectly. This is not its design purpose. Are you catching the drift on this? I love this because he's not condemning the individuals, but what he's doing is condemning the practice. Just like he condemned in the previous chapter 11 when he said, stop taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Do you see any of us getting all up in arms like, oh, how dare him? Oh, no, you cannot sleep with your father's wife. Really? Oh, what a nasty, mean person Paul is for correcting that. We don't say that either. So why is it we get so mad when we say, look, you cannot do tongues in the way that you are doing at church? This church at Corinth had taken what God had ordained for evangelism tool and misused it. And in the doing of that, now Paul is coming back in and he's saying, look, I want you guys to get this right. I don't want you to be unaware. I want you to actually know what its design purpose is. So that when you're operating in it, you're glorifying God. You're actually doing it for the common good. You are going to bring about, a, what, what is it, to edify the body for the common good, to build the body up in some fashion. And you guys are not doing that. All right, so in here, he also goes on to talk about religious movements before the 1900s, religious movements since the 1900s, okay? Then he goes into a whole section on the Pentecostal tongues and talks about specifically the errors that are going on in most of the, as far as I know, all of them, but maybe I'm in error on that, but I will, I so I'll caveat it with most of them just to cover myself to say, I don't know enough to know it all. But what I do know about most Pentecostal uh, groups is they're doing it in error. Okay. Now, what would be lovely is if they would read 1 Corinthians as we have and study it in this way and correct it. And say, you know what, we're going to allow speaking in tongues. And you know what, I'll bet a lot of those people in there actually do have the gift of tongues. But I'll bet there's a lot of them who don't. They have been coerced in some manner to fall victim to it. Why? Because what do they say about tongues? It's the evidence of your salvation. And so you feel pressured. And it's like, oh, I know I'm saved. I know it. I know it. I got to do something. And so they do. And it's so sad because it's such an, it's almost a, like a child abuse. It's a form of child abuse to the young Christian to force them into that. So I love his book because he's so, he's just so straightforward in the things he does. Um, there was one thing in here he says about, and I don't know why he calls them liberals. So there's a liberal thing in here. Even liberals and others who deny the inspiration of the scripture. He's speaking about liberal-minded towards the theologically liberal, okay? He said even, even they deny the inspiration of the scriptures. Even liberals and others who deny the inspiration of the scriptures, the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the substitutionary atonement and the resurrection have become involved in tongue speaking. Undoubtedly, the vacuum created by their lack of real spiritual life has contributed much to this replacement phenomenon of glossia, which is the tongues. Um, I think I'll just leave it at that because if you are interested, I'd be happy for someone to borrow my messed up book. <laughs> Um, or you can just go online. I'm sure it's not very expensive, but it, it you you all can take a look at this. And, and I will try to get all the, I've got most of it on here, and I don't know who the publisher is. Um, I can't even see a publisher's name on this, but I'm sure it's in here. Biblical Publications. Oh, I, I got this in Belgium. 
when I was in Germany. Sorry, but I'm sure it's online somewhere. It's English, <laughs> and he's somewhere from here in the States. So you might want to get that book for yourself because it's so simple and straightforward. It's not complicated. Anybody can understand it. You could hand it to any person and say, just take a look at this. It would be a good resource for you, okay? All right, so that gives you a little tidbit. Context to this is that mess that we just talked about, okay? Now, now that you have all that behind you, um, all right, now let's go into what we looked at this week in homework. And boy, was it good. Did you guys have a good time with that first with that um those john passages first john oops hold on i gotta get mine it's in the back here on the back part of my homework pull it out but boy i had a bunch of lists too pull out your lists if you have them handy on the things that that you developed from okay so see here this is crazy all these lists i mean if that's not a a a list of lists of lists, right? First um, Corinthians 13, we we were asked to look at all of the various qualities and kind of d define them, right? One of the things she asked us to do. And so um, I I broke it down verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, and First Corinthians 13. And I just went through and defined every one of the words. Did anybody do that? I know it wasn't part, exactly the assignment, but I gave, I did word studies on all the, <laughs> the qualities given in 1 Corinthians 13. Um, what is patience? To be long-suffering, to persevere patiently and bravely in enduring misfortunes and troubles. To be kind is to show oneself mild, gentle in behavior. So I did that kind of a thing first. And once I had those done, she asked us to look at Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit, and make a comparison. Were you able to do that? Kind of, sort of? If you didn't do the word studies, it would have been more complicated. Uh, because I think the word studies more clearly define for you what these words actually meant over here. And I went through and did word studies on every one of those fruits of the spirits as well to match them up. I know that's kind of over the top, but in any event, it was helpful in, in matching things up. So we're going to be talking about that kind of as a, as a backdrop to looking at what First John has to say. But what I would like to do with First John, hold on, I think it's back here. What I want to do with 1 John is because we have the problem in the charismatic persuasion, and this is where we're bouncing off of is what happened last week with the subject of tongues, because they do teach or they do make a proclamation, and we're all familiar with it, that that's the indicator of your, of your salvation is speaking in tongues, right? What I want to do is counter that for you, and I want to show you through 1 John how 1 John shows you how you can know that you have salvation. As we said earlier, um, that the verse in there, it says, these things have I written that you may know that you have eternal life. So let's talk about that first off. Let's talk about, um, we'll start with chapter 1. What do you think about chapter 1 when you can open up your first John because you're going to need that to be handy. I should probably open mine too. Where's mine? All the way over here. But she practically gave us the whole book. She started us in 3. We did 3, 4, and part of 5. So you uh, you practically did the whole thing. That's why I'm being brave and taking you into this right now because you you pretty much did do the whole the whole chapter. What is First John chapter one about? What does he say in there about your relationship with God and the person that is actually a believer? What is, what does it say about that person? Go start down in verse 5. Somebody read verse uh, 5 to 7. Let's just do those. And maybe 9 also. 5 to 7 and then ch jump over to 9. Who wants to read that? Okay, thank you.
Okay, now, before you read 9, what does it mean to walk in the light in context of what Scripture is talking about here? What's in darkness? Sin. So if you're walking in the light, what are you doing? You're, you're, con you're either confessing sin, right, and coming out into the light, or you're exposing sin by coming out into the light, right? Does that make sense to you? I remember one of the things my daughter has said over and over when she counsels us is one of her favorite things is she says, look, if you're keeping anything in the dark, get it out. Even if it's going to hurt you at first, getting it out into the light. Sunlight is the best disinfectant and it's the best way of healing. And if you once you expose the sin to light and it's all been laid out there, now Satan cannot use it as a tool against you. Even if you're going through a divorce, even if you're going through a, 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 some kind of a legal battle, even if you're going through marital conflict, even if whatever your issues are in your personal dynamics and in the world, if you take whatever was in darkness and lay it out there, say, okay, well, this is my problem and this is what's been going on. And it's, it's why God tells us, confess your sins to one another right? Because once you say it out loud and everybody is in the room now is aware of it, now you can deal with it. Now you can get, you can work through it. Now you can move forward. And Satan has just been disarmed. Okay, so look at what it says in verse 9 then. Yes, you did. Okay. Okay, so and if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, what's really cool about 1 John, first of all, is it's a Gnostic teaching. He's, he's fighting against Gnosticism, right? And so through the whole book, it's a contrast between what's true and what's a lie. So if you mark your contrast, first of all, you're going to have a gazillion contrast when you go through 1 John, right? But the contrast shows you what's true and what's false, what's true and what's false, what's true and what's false. And so what he's saying here is, is if you say you have no sin and you're going to hide in your little corner and be little miss self-righteous, right? Uh, you're a liar and you're calling God a liar. And it's simply not true. But you can stay in that darkness if that's where you want to be. That's your choice. But as a Christian, if you truly have the Holy Spirit w within you, the Holy Spirit who himself is light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world, right? So if you are the light in you, if you have that light dwelling within you, then he says, what must we do? confess your sins and he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins if you will and he says so you have to do what two things walk in the light and confess your sins and that is evidence that you actually have the spirit in you because you know what the holy spirit will keep convicting you until you do until you make your confession it burdens you it weighs on you it eats at you right so a, how am I going to know who a true Christian is? First of all, they, conf they confess that they are a sinner or they confess sin, right? And they walk in, the, they walk in light. And, we, and the light simply means truth, righteousness, God's, can, it can mean all kinds of things, and we can expand on that. But, the, but walking in light simply means you come out of the darkness of, of being hidden in sin, and now you've exposed that sin, and now you're going to walk in truth. Okay, so chapter two now goes on. It takes that concept of you come in, you're coming out of darkness into light, you're walking in it, you've confessed your sin, and now what does he say in chapter two now? Um, how about you go to verse 3 and then verse 27. Let's just read those two. Who wants to read that? Thank you, Susan. Okay.
Okay, so two qualities I wanted to point out for you in this that I think relate to what we're talking about in First John um, concerning the subject of love and how do you know that you're saved, number one, and secondarily, how do you know what this love is? What is this thing called love? right? That we talk about. What is this thing called love? And so we're trying to work our way in that direction. So there's two things here. The first thing in chapter, uh, in verse three is it says that if we actually know God, what? We keep chapter two, you keep his commandments. So how do you know if someone is saved? They keep his commandments. Why? Because they've come into the light. They're no longer walking in the darkness of deeds that are dark, but now they're walking in the commandments of God. And it says as a, as a result, and his anointing abides in him. Because, of, because we're walking in the light, we know that his anointing, and what is the anointing? Holy Spirit, right? By the Spirit. Abides in us. I love that. So that's verse 3 and 27. Up here it was verse 7 and 9 for the chapter 1. Okay, so now let's do chapter 3. And I really, I now we're into where you guys did do your homework. So this one should be especially easy for you. And try not to just hone in on the word love because otherwise all three chapters are going to be love, 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 right? But in chapter 3, we see that he gives some instructions concerning how they know that they are saved. Let's read verse 7 and 24. What does 7 say? Who's got that? Martha, do 7 and 24 for us. <laughs> Make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness, righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Right. So because he is righteous, right? Just as he is righteous, if he abides in us, we then we are righteous. How do we know that? We practice righteousness. Okay? Then what does it say in 24? 24. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Okay, so we know it by the Spirit. So in other words, the Spirit is manifested, and how it's manifested in a way that you know that person knows the Lord, they're walking in righteousness. They know the commandments, and now they're walking in the commandments, right? We practice righteousness. I just went from they to we, so that's kind of nice. We. <laughs> Right? We practice righteousness. Because he abides in us. And that's in 7 and 24. Now there's a whole bunch more too. If you go back and read it, you're going to see it's it's repeated, repeated, repeated through that, throughout that whole chapter. Now let's go to 4. In chapter 4, let's look at verse 12 and just 12 and 13. I think that should pretty much take care of it. Who wants to read that for us? These are familiar because we've looked at them. Thank you, Jan. Oh, very interesting. So because he's given us his spirit, we know that he is in us. And how do we know that he is in us? Because we do what? What do we do? We love one another. <laughs> okay, we love. So chapter 4 teaches us that we love by the, by the love of God that abides in us by his spirit, right? We love. And it's by the spirit in us. That's in 12 to 13. Now one more chapter. That's, it's kind of nice about going into some of these smaller epistles. You can get through them quickly. We'll, we'll have done First John in our in our whole class. We're, 
Amazing. you all done. <laughs> okay, First John 5. Let's look at, um, oh, I, I had a hard time picking the verses. Let's do 5 and 6 and also 10. Who wants to read that for me? 5 and 6 and verse 10. Kathy, thank you. Yes. The one who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the witness that God has borne concerning him. Okay, so when you when you look at also, if you go back to verse 7, although I didn't have you read that one, it says, it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is the truth. So if the Spirit is the witness, and then in verse 10 it says, the one who believes in the Son of God has the witness in him. So what is it saying that's in you? The Holy Spirit. And, and what is it that you do that proves you have the Holy Spirit in you? What do you confess? That Jesus is the Christ, he's the Son of God. So your confession is correct. Do you remember back in 1 Corinthians 12 when we first started this, there's a, a kind of a funky statement. So I'm going to go back to, I'm, I'm not sure if you have to read 2 and 3. It could be, but in first, let's read the first three because we are going to end up there at the end of this anyway. Let's just read all three verses. But consider what it says about that if we have the Holy Spirit within us, then we make the confession, the verbal confession, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now read what it says in 1, 2, and 3. Yeah, in 1 Corinthians 12. There you go. So you cannot you cannot say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. Now, we know that the Spirit, an unbeliever could actually verbalize it if they wanted to, right? Oh, Jesus is Lord. And they could be lying. But what it's speaking about is the truthfulness of it. If you're truly a believer, only a real believer believes that, lives it, says it. But when they say it, in context of 1 John, it's not just the verbal confession. It's all of this, right? And you cannot do it unless you actually have the Holy Spirit. You cannot live your life in a, in a, in a, prostrate position before God confessing that you're a sinner and you need him right you can't walk in the light of that unless you actually know the Lord unless he's dwelling in you why not because what is the natural instinct of a person of a person without the spirit of God concerning sin to pretend like they don't sin there is no such thing as sin I'm not a sinner you're not a sinner we're all good people Right? We do good things. I'm not bad. I'm not in jail or in prison. I didn't do anything that got me arrested this week. Right? So that's what it's talking about. It's not talking about the just the the overt things, but, but there are people, and I remember early, early in my faith walk, trying to witness to a lady who lived right in my cul-de-sac in Turkey where we were living. And she had a little girl. She was about three years old. Her name was Lisa, little tyrant. Oh, my gosh. And um, mom, mom and I were visiting one day and talking about things. And I brought up the subject of sin because I was trying to be evangelistic, which I'm not. I found that out real quick. I'm not an evangelist, but I was trying. I was putting my toe in the water. And in the conversation, though, basically, she she came back and said, listen, my daughter is not a sinner. Because I said, well, we all sin. My daughter is not a sinner. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. She went to her daughter. And, um, I, and I can remember the conversation was about the fact that she literally did not believe that on the whole, she was a sinner. Her daughter was not a sinner. Her daughter was just a little baby, a little girl, maybe three or so at the time. Terror. But she was like my son, <laughs> a terror. And her mom just said, it doesn't matter. She did not see that as a, as something that deserved 
judgment or that God would condemn someone to hell because they're a sinner, you know, when her daughter's just a little girl, I'm going, well, I'm not saying God is condemning your daughter, but I said, the principle is true that we we are born with a sin nature. We come into this world with this desire to demand to have things our own way. And this is where the argument came in. So a unbeliever will not go there with you. They don't start on that premise. You and I do. We come to a place by the illumination that only God can give to your heart and mind. That fundamentally we are we are in a frail body, which as we looked at this week a little bit about the flesh, right? We want to lean toward the flesh. We want to satisfy our sin nature. And it actually requires discipline on our part. A It does require a prostrate position before God. We must be willing on a daily basis to go before God and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I desperately need you in my life. And I know that I need a daily sanctification. By the way, 1 John 1, 9, confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins of all unrighteousness, that is not speaking about justification. That's sanctification. That's the prayer of the believer who goes regularly back to God. Um, The way I described it when I've taught it before is, this is not a bath. This is a sprinkling. It's a splashing, right? And so what God is doing on a daily basis, you've already been dunked. All you need is your feet washed. And so that's what's going on in 1 John chapter 1. You're going to you're going to confess your sins cuz you're going to recognize yourself as a sinner. And uh, the chapter 2 you keep his commandments, chapter 3 we practice righteousness, Back to, uh, chapter 4 we love, and chapter 5 we believe, we make confession of who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, that he's our savior. And therefore, so we know that we have the spirit abiding Okay, so that's, I'm just going to put 5 to 10, and then I'm going to revert you to 1 Corinthians 12, 3, to, as an extra little point of interest, because that really actually restates it. If you actually know God, you will confess who God is, who Christ is. Okay, so that lays down the bigger thing, and what I think uh, hopefully this will do for you is in the future, if you ever have that challenge put back at you, that, well, if you don't have the the sign of tongues, then there's you don't have assurance of salvation. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not even saved. Or the other part of it is it's anointing. It's a special anointing, right? It's a special place that you're better than or greater than whatever. It, I don't, the implication is that there's something special about people who do speak in tongues. And the rest of us, well, we're just kind of second-class citizens. What does that tell you right there about the, that concept of elevating the gift of tongues above others? I'm sorry, say that again? Okay, yeah. It is kind of a power trip on their part because it makes... This is what was going on in First Cor- in the chat, the book, the... Uh, Church of First Corinthians, of Corinthians, wasn't First Corinthians, of Corinthians, <laughs> Corinth, right? Of which I've been to many times. Okay, so Corinth, um, this church was misusing this gift. So is it, does it surprise us at all that it would be misused today too? I mean, is there anything under heaven that does not come around again, Right? I remember, isn't it in Ecclesiastes that Solomon says that there's nothing new under heaven? It always comes back around. So don't be surprised. This is not a new phenomenon. The subject of speaking in tongues is not a new phenomenon either. The deceiver who likes to falsify things, who likes to, who dece- who likes to deceive us, he also uses that in the, in the unsaved world in various forms. And that, that, um, misunderstanding of it got brought into the church and you know it's quite likely even the initiation of it into some of the churches was by people who were not actually saved and they got into the church and they wanted to 
convince people they belonged. And so this got started somehow. I w probably need to do a history. I think I did do some history work on this years ago, but I've forgotten most of it. Um, but to, to restudy it, if you if this is a subject matter in your life, people in your world that this comes up a lot, you should research it more. Just like you should research any subject more if it's what God seems to keep putting you in the middle of. If it's about, if it's about, I won't even, I won't go there. If it's about any subject that you know is wrong and is an error, is a wrong doctrine, a false teaching, and it's part of your life through your family or through neighbors or friends, study up on it. Find out what was the root cause of this? Where did this come from? Where, when did it start in history? How did it come from, from where it came from, right? I, I, a couple years ago, my, my friends and I spent the summer studying um, uh, just even how we got the different denominations. Where did they break down in history and at what point did they kind of come up and what instigated what we're looking at today or for many generations where we were the, we called us the whole Catholic church in our and, and it, meaning the, the totality of all believers on earth, right? But we were all part of one body. Well, now we got Protestants and Catholics. When did that happen? So we looked at that. So these are very interesting, and it, and it helps to identify what the source of the problem is, where it came from. And you can speak with some measure of intelligence if you're going to give apologetics, you know, in your answer, okay? Okay, now let's dig into First John 5. We've got just a little bit of time left. And we want to talk about the subject of love, which I think is pretty straightforward. But I know it was really um, a lot of work. She wanted us to look at every single thing. First thing he said, one of the problems they, they started with is, he says, I know that you are zealous for gifts. Do you guys know what the word zealous means? Did anybody do a word study on that? That was in 1 Corinthians uh, 14, 1 and 12, actually. The first time he says it, it does, he doesn't use the word zealous. Look at verse, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 and see how it's stated there. It's the same word, by the way, but it's just stated differently. Desire earnestly. Sounds better, right? A little nicer. The other one he says in, four, in verse 12, 14, 12 in 1 Corinthians, what does that say? Okay, so what does that tell you about what they were doing there? They were. But almost like you wonder for, you know, I want this for this, I want this, this has value, this doesn't. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like they weren't being zealous for gifts that actually edified anybody other than themselves, right? It's kind of what it, the implication in the way that he makes the statement is that you're seeking it for the wrong reason. Your motivation is off, right? So when he says zealous, this word by definition, this is number 2206, Z-E-L-O-O, -O, and it this is what it means. It means to burn with zeal. That could be a good thing if it's in the right place, right? To be jealous. Now there's a problem, right? Although I, I've even heard God is a jealous God. Have you? So it could be put in a positive light, potentially. But then it also says to covet. Uh, to self-exert. To strive after or to envy. So it goes into the negative the further down into the definition you see it. Uh, it means covet. If you're going to covet something, covet these. Um, it has to do with self-exerting, strive after, but it also means to envy, which is not good, or, or to burn. Now, I thought this was interesting. To burn with zeal, that made me think of that one point where he says, even if I give my body over to be burned, and I went, oh, there they are burning, <laughs> that word burn, it just popped in my mind for some reason. Okay, now, tell me what you saw in 1 John 3. You were to go through and look at the subject of love and see what its motivation is, and how, what did you learn in 1 John 3 about love?
Okay. Love. We are to love our brother. We are to love our brother. Now, and, and that is in 1 John 3 what? 10. Okay. Now, how can we do that? If the subject matter is love, where does love come from? What did you learn in 1 John 4 about that? Where does love come from? Okay. Love, it actually says God is love. Now, that's a slightly different way of looking at it, and that's in 415, right? Let's follow chapter 4. Let's see if I can find my observation worksheet on that. I kind of like to follow the flow of thought on that, starting in 1 John 4. Those verses, I think, are probably the most um, insightful on, this, on what we're looking at here. We start in 1 John 4. Ver, let's um, let's start with eleven. I'm not sure if we should go all the way through eighteen, but maybe maybe we can go through nineteen. Okay, let's kind of stick in that area right there, 11 through 19, and that'll help you have a more um, focused area to look rather than your eyes going everywhere on this. I just want you to kind of follow the trail of thought. So if God is love, what does he say then about love? We know that God abides in us, right? How does he ab abide in us? How do we get this love in us? How, how does that happen according to what you look at here in these verses? Okay, so it begins, as we already said in 1 John, that it's through this proper confession. When you've made the proper confession, then God is going to abide in you. How? What does he tell you? Look in verse 12. He says that his love is perfected in us. If we're trying to figure out how do we love in the way that we are supposed to, I mean, if, if, if because after all, what is 1 Corinthians 13 telling us about spiritual gifts in relationship to this subject? What does it say? They should be. And as a matter of fact, if they're not, what? They're nothing. As he opens that up. He says, look, if you have... If you have um, all languages and you can speak all things, whether it be of man or of angel, um, and, but you're a, a clanging, you're just a clanging kong and, and a clanging cymbal or something like that, right? Yeah, I, I got it wrong. But anyway, you're just noisy, right? And he says, and even if you have all prophecy, all knowledge, all, all insight of all kinds, but if you don't have what? Love, what? It's nothing. So he really diminishes your gift, doesn't he, when you remove love. So w without love, your gifts are zero. You may as well not have one. It is a big zip. Because what happens, do you think, if you don't exercise them in love? Explain from your own perspective and your own experiences. If a person does have a great spiritual gift of leadership, for instance, but they aren't exercising it in love, and the love we're speaking of is the kind of love that God has, what? Okay, so love itself is is almost like a glue. It kind of it kind of connects us in a way that gives us. A sense of trusting one another then. Okay. What else? What, el what else can a leader do if he's not loving the way God says he should? Yeah. He can think that his leadership is all about him. So his focus changes from being about the body of Christ. Not, no longer is it for the common good. No longer is it for the kingdom work. Right? Now it's I'm the leader. 
right? You get inflated. What else? I become a dictator. You become actually harsh, right? And, and manipulative, possibly. Okay, so without love, remember when I first started teaching some of the gifts, I was showing you what a person walking in the spirit would be like with a certain gift and then what they might be either in weaknesses or if they're not walking in the spirit. How, you know, um, a person with the gift of mercy could be so kind and so loving and so encouraging if they're walking in the spirit. But if they're in the flesh, what might they what might they do with their gift? They might enable that person who's downtrodden to to literally just stay there. Another thing that really happens with the, with a gift of mercy, not to pick on you, mercy girls, because we love you, but the mercy gift, um, because they find their value in exercising their gift, and they should. You know, it does make it does make you feel good. I'm not saying you can't feel good about your gift, but that's not your purpose, right? But what can happen if you're a mercy girl and really the only time you feel good is when you're putting your arm around somebody and hugging them? What what might be the, the possibility in that relationship? Yes, you get them dependent on you instead of upon God. And you want them to stay there. This is why I always talk about sometimes counseling can become dangerous because counselors are only valued if they're counseling, right? And it's their income, sort of, right? And I'm speaking of this from a mom of a, of a person who's doing this now. But um, if you keep them dependent on you and you keep them in the place of despair, then you keep go back and hug them. And it makes you feel good and needed, right? So without love as the motivation, you pervert your giftedness, your, the giftings that you've been given, and the outcome is what? You're not really helping the body of Christ. Instead of edifying the body of Christ, you're actually damaging the body of Christ. You're actually hurting the body. Okay, so in this, he says in verse 12, no one has seen God at any time, and if we love one another, God abides in us. So this love that he's talking about is necessary, and by it, we can know that God is abiding in us. And he says, and if he's abiding in us, then his love is perfected in us. Now, I want to look at that word perfected. Did anybody look it up? Yes. Um, it's fifty forty eight. Oh, good. And I didn't put the transliteration on my sheet here. But tell me what what perfected means. Good girl. To bring to its end or an an end. Okay. To complete, okay, to complete, perfect. okay, all right, any other thoughts? I think it's 5048, guys, okay, yeah, did anybody else look it up? Okay, the other, the other part of this is that it's brought to its purpose or it's reached the goal. Now, that really makes sense to me. If it's reached the goal, what he's saying here then, if you reread this, no one has seen God at any time, implied as but. But if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is brought to its goal in us. It's brought to its designed purpose in us. I mean, why do you think God gave us his spirit? I mean, really think about it. This is the grand design, the plan. The plan is that he would put his spirit within us. There, that literally, we would just simply be able to follow him, period, in all ways, right? But in the subject of love, if you don't have the spirit of God dwelling in you, is it even possible? Think about it. Is it possible? Think about the kind of love that the unsaved world offers. Now, 
certainly we're not saying they can't be exhibiting kindness, right? But generally, would you say that their motivation Yeah. I think of the verse where it says that he loved us while we were yet what? Sinners. So the Christian love, the kind of love that God wants us to arrive at is not just the kind of love that says, "Well, I love that brother, I love that person because well, I feel an obligation or I like them because they're part of my family or or we have things in common. I mean, the motivation in earthly, fleshly love, although the result of it can sometimes definitely be good. It can't, it's not that I'm saying it's not doesn't have any positives. It can. But will it go to the next level? Will it go to the point of what about the one who's undeserving? What if it's the really difficult kid on the block who is in trouble all the time, who's a smart mouth, who's got a potty mouth, who's in trouble maybe with the law or at least in trouble with mommy and daddy all the time, right? They're beating people up or being selfish themselves. They're the unlovable ones. And yet when when it comes to the love of God, what is our motivation? It's to see beyond that, right? To see the value of the person themselves. That's what the real goal is. Can we get there if God does not give us his spirit? Probably not. I would say definitely not. Because there's always going to be, even, even, truly, even as a Christian, we still tend to fall back on our flesh of, I'm more motivated to love you guys because you like me. Right? Right? I mean, it's it's a... It, it is a natural thing to want to be around people who like you and then you like them back. It's why groups of people tend to hang together. Yeah. But what about the one from the outside that you bring in that nobody seems to like and that person rubs everyone wrong? Are you able to still ex coexist? And do so in a loving manner. Even, I mean, it's not to say that your emotions are always on board with it, right? Because you're not always emotionally going to love that person that way. But what what is this kind of love? It, it, it's unconditional and it's an act of the will. It's an act of obedience, right? Oh, I wish there were, though. <laughs> Sometimes I'd like to escape. I can can any of you give a testimony of conversations that you've had with people in your in your life since you've become a Christian where they're going I don't know how you love that person I don't know how you can hang out with that person I don't know how you can tolerate that person have you had those kinds of comments come to you I mean I have my son's conversations with me on a regular basis is I don't know how you how you do that mom I'm like well I don't want him dead I just want him saved or I want him to go away but you know I don't want bad things to happen to a person where a person who's unsaved I cannot tell you the things that my my lovely unsaved son has said about certain people it's like you know, take them out and do this and this and this and I mean it's like oh my gosh Eric no <laughs> why would you wish that on anyone why well because he doesn't have the spirit of God in him and he sees things from the world's perspective so you and I can understand this that because God has given us his spirit his love is perfected in us it came to its attended goal it was God's design from the beginning to give you his spirit to enable you that's the power if you don't have the Holy Spirit you can't love the way God says to love this is why in the church sometimes we see abuses of spiritual gifting and abuses on whole whether it's within the realm of gifts or not. But he says this. So he says um, his love is perfected in us because he abides in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. He promised it. Do you believe it? Do you know it? Did he say it? Is it true? 
That's, that's the bottom line. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So it's a confession. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, then God does abide in him and he in God. That is faith. And we have come to know and have believed the love of God, which is for us. God is love. So we can put that. God is love. 415. And um, whoever confesses Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So God is love. God abides in us. Right? And then he goes on to say, um, by this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because he is also, because he is, is love. So also are we also, oh no, because he is in the world. We also are in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. So God abides in us and therefore we love. And how does he abide in us? By his spirit. Okay. Awesome. Any questions concerning this topic about love and the, the importance of it in spiritual gifts? Pretty simple. Yes. I thought it was pretty straightforward. I didn't think it was difficult. It was a very um, excellent way, though, I think, to tie up the subject of gifts because it goes to the motivation behind what we're doing and why we do the things that we do. Uh, in the kingdom work. Okay, you guys, thank you so much. It was a lovely journey into spiritual gifts with you. I hope you understand a little bit better about what it is that we call spiritual gifts and why we have them and why it